So these are my disclosures, which only tangentially deal with the topic or touch on the topic I'll be discussing. So um, I'll do a case-based uh, presentation of this topic um, uh, around uh, two not totally uncommon uh, clinical situations we encounter where anticoagulation in the setting of thrombocytopenia might be required. One is in immune thrombocytopenia and ITP, and the other one is in the cancer patient. So this is actually a, a patient I saw about a month ago as a second opinion, um, who was a 39-year-old woman with a very long history of immune thrombocytopenia, who had been through uh, most of the effective therapies, diagnosed way back when, had had a splenectomy, uh, had gone through, uh, obviously, steroids, IVIG, uh, had gone through uh, some of the thrombopoietic agents and rituximab, um, who actually presented in February of 2017 with a one-month history of persistent headache. She had actually um, responded to um, rituximab and uh, somewhat unusual in this disease, um, actually been placed on maintenance back in 2010, uh, rituximab about every six months, quite unconventional. And I actually had never done that in my practice, but uh, this hematologist had done it. Um, and um, it was effective, but uh, after she was in remission for many years, um, decided to actually taper off her rituximab and stop it last April. So she presented as the etiology of her headaches as having cerebral venous thrombosis. Um, and uh, you're called for treatment advice by the emergency room prior to admission. Her platelet count now is still okay. It's 109,000, although I dare say uh, over the previous years she was maintaining rituximab, it was higher. Her PT and PTT are normal. So what are some of the clinical questions uh, one might ask about this scenario of ITP now, complicated uh, by uh, cerebral venous thrombosis? Um, is there a prior history of VTE? Is there a family history of VTE? Uh, is ITP a risk factor for VTE? Uh, does she have evidence of antiphospholipid antibody syndrome? Another key question always in the setting of any thrombosis, uh, venous thrombosis, is she on estrogens or pregnant? She's not, since those are clearly risk factors for thrombosis in this region as they are for other sites of DVT. So, um, with respect to um, her history, really nothing else other than what I've told you. Um, so her platelet count now of 109,000 is adequate to start therapeutic anticoagulation. Her renal and hepatic function are normal, and there's no other bleeding risk. So what are our options for treating this patient? Um, obviously, the conventional one of lobacoid heparin warfarin. Uh, one could use a direct oral anticoagulant. She doesn't have any contraindications to it, although uh, one has to be a little wary now that um, she had not been... <clears throat> She'd been off that maintenance rituxan, and her platelet count now is lower, so it may be susceptible to dropping. Or there is another uh, DOAC option, uh, not widely used, uh, where you have a low molecular heparin lead-in follow for a DOAC. And then the other question while you start anticoagulation is how you manage her ITP. So um, let me... Um, answer some of the questions uh, that are posed by this type of patient. Uh, first off, do patients with ITP have an increased risk of VTE? And there's actually data that uh, there's about a two and a half fold increased incidence in chronic ITP uh, compared to matched controls from a dangerous registry study. So we didn't conventionally think of immune thrombocytopenia as, as being associated with increased risk of thrombotic complications, but indeed uh, there does see, seem to be a somewhat higher risk in this setting, and actually splenectomy uh, may be part of this risk that the post-splenectomy state confers some increased thrombotic risk for reasons that aren't entirely clear mechanistically. 
There's another study from the UK that showed a modest increased risk over five years, about a hazard ratio of 1.58 fold, comparing ITP patients with matched controls. So, you know, this is one of the things that if we still rarely do splenectomies, we should think about in terms of downside risk, as well as, of course, the infection risk due to encapsulated organisms. And this is finally another review from claims data showing quantitatively an absolute risk over years. So this particular patient had responded to high dose steroids in the past and had a sustained response following rituximab. Um, so what do we do for this particular woman? Three to six months of anticoagulation versus indefinite obviously carefully followed during anticoagulation versus preemptive treatment to tr increase her platelet count now that her platelet count is a little bit lower. So I don't think there's clearly a right or a wrong answer. What was done in this particular case was she was treated actually in the conventional manner with um, uh, lomacoid heparin followed by warfarin with close follow-up. Uh, but the hematologist was also quite concerned uh, that uh, her ITP was relapsing and actually started her back um, on uh, another four-week course of rituximab at that core point. And then he referred to me, is this, is this uh, appropriate way to handle this particular patient? Of course, when I saw her, now her platelet count was actually had dropped to 80,000, and she was being well anticoagulated, unfortunately. Even uh, despite that, she had progressive thrombosis in her um, cerebral sinuses despite uh, very appropriate warfarin management and uh, her platelet count was still hanging over 50,000. I'll get into the issues of anticoagulation of people as their counts drop. When she progressed on warfarin, we actually switched over, or he actually switched over, I should say, to uh, chronic lomalacoid heparin for a while uh, until um, her thrombotic diathesis improved. So, you know, what are your options to actually increase the platelets um, if, let's see, if they fall below 50,000, obviously steroids or uh, either dexamethasone or prednisone. Um, IVIG obviously can give a most rapid response. It works probably best in non-splenectomized patients. She was splenectomized. We have thrombopoietic agents we could use uh, and rituximab. Um, the thing about the latter two agents are they're somewhat slower acting, uh, up to several weeks to work. Obviously, if IVIG were to work, although in this particular patient, uh, there's a track record of having used IVIG and probably without great effect, and it's probably best in people who are splenectomized, although it will work, and then, of course, we have steroids. So there may be a little bit of um, uh, chewing your fingernails if her platelet count drops severely. What about this question of thrombopoietic mimetic agents about increasing the risk of VTE? This sometimes and certainly was a concern when these agents were, were first approved. Um, I know this is quite difficult to see the numbers, but uh, I would point out that these are from the trials of Ramiplastin and Altrombopag. And for Ramiplastin, at least in the pivotal trials against placebo, they could not see a clear increased risk in uh, thrombosis. Now, of course, this is controlling the platelet count and uh, keeping a close watch on it and not having thrombocytosis result from the therapy and keeping your platelet count probably under 200,000 in people getting romiplostin if they respond for ITP. Uh, there was suggestion of a small signal with l uh, from, from from some of the studies. Um, that you can see, you can see 2% uh, versus zero on the placebo. But there's more, been more long-term follow-up with l which of course is oral. This was from the open label extension trial. And you could see the number of VT events being 11 or 4% resulting with, in withdrawal. Obviously, it's not controlled. Uh, this again is the Ramiplastin data showing that that seemed to be relatively uh, clean of thrombotic complications when the drug was used in the trials from a review of the various studies that were done, both the uh, randomized studies against placebo, standard of care, and long-term extension trials. So um, what can we say? Uh, they look certainly pretty clean. Could there be a slight increase that was seen? Well, the pag, it's obviously 
stated in the package insert. Um, and I think it becomes hard to discern from these underlying risks of thrombosis that go with ITPH and other underlying risks to begin with. Um, and um, while I made a comment about the platelet count, they didn't see a clear relationship to platelet count, but of course, they try to keep the platelet count well controlled in these, in these studies and no relationship to duration of use. So let me turn to uh, perhaps another uh, bit more common scenario of um, the patient uh, with uh, active malignancy who develops a clot. So this is a 58-year-old male with an IgG kappa myeloma for six years who's diagnosed with symptomatic segmental PEs on day 15 of an autotransplant as an outpatient. His Lenny's are negative for DVT, which happens about 50% of the time with papal, with presenting with pulmonary embolism across the board. So don't be surprised if you can't find the clots. It's one of these paradoxes. We believe they come from the leg and the pelvis, but if you look very hard, you just can't find them. Did they all break off? It's hard to believe that um, some vestiges of clot may not be visualized, uh, but it's one of those paradoxes that um, one just has to accept. Uh, same disease, but you can't find those clots in the leg. So he has moderate to right-sided chest pain and dyspnea with exertion. His heart rate's 102. Blood pressure is 132 over 78. His room air sets at 91%. Kidney and liver function are normal, but his platelet count is 11,000. So you decide to treat this patient. Um, uh, and here are some of your options uh, with respect to treatment. One is to um, support the patient's platelet count with a platelet transfusion followed by unfractionated heparin by, uh, by a drip with PTT monitoring. Two is just throw in an IVC filter. Um, whether they have, obviously you feel better if they have DVTs, but uh, oftentimes, as they say, they don't. Um, do you put them on a DOAC? Um, I, I put up a Pixaban up there because if you look across all the trials, um, a Pixaban seems to have the best safety profile and in fact, compared to uh, lumbacoid heparin warfarin, it had about a 70% reduction in major bleeding, of course, in non-thrombocytopenic patients, 10 milligram twice a day for a week, then five twice a day. Of course, there's no reversal agent if the patient were to bleed. Platelet transfusion and lumbacoid heparin. Uh, lumbacoid heparin is a pretty short half-life in people with normal renal function every 12 hours or place a retrieval filter, no anticoagulation as the bleeding risk is too high. So um, let's talk about some of the factors to think about. Um, um, some of the old studies of the mortality of not treating P at all, uh, certainly not with anticoagulation with a filter, suggests perhaps a 25 to 30 percent mortality. Um, most recent um, data suggest uh, missed PE might have a 5 percent mortality. Some of you might have seen a recent New England Journal article a few months back about Italian studies suggesting that we're maybe missing some PEs in people who present with unexplained syncope. The issue about acute VTE and major mortality risk is usually in the first six weeks after the event occurs. And believe it or not, some people with PE can improve with no treatment at all. Um, it's not something I would certainly recommend with that mortality, but some PEs can resolve on their own, as can BVTs after filter placement, uh, although um, it's it certainly, I have for proximal DVT a strong preference for treating if possible. And for cancer patients, a fatal PE within three months of the first treated VTE, 2.6% um, uh, uh, from a large Spanish registry. So what's the factors to consider? The bleeding risk, approximately 7% bleeding rate in cancer patients with VTE on anticoagulation with normal platelet count. So already your cancer population is considerably higher risk for major bleeding, even if their platelet count is normal. Typically, the normal major bleed rates uh, with anticoagulation in the non-cancer setting are, are more like uh, 2%. Fatal bleeding in cancer patients on within three months, 1%, again, from the Spanish registry. This patient has no other bleeding risks other than their severe thrombocytopenia and their uh, ongoing myeloma and the duration hopefully limited in this patient, uh, 
uh, uh, given that uh, after the transplant and their platelet count could bounce back. So obviously um, a platelet support strategy followed by anticoagulation would be a reasonable option uh, and hopefully their platelet count would recover so that uh, you'd be able to get through it without indefinite platelet exposure. So there are actually limited data, dedicated studies in cancer patients with thrombocytopenia. Um, here are some of the references, one from Leukemia and Lymphoma in 2004, uh, 10 patients treated with varying doses of low-market heparin for uh, VT central access catheter prophylaxis. The dose was decreased during platelet nadirs, no major bleeding. That's something you consider trying. Um, actually, the therapeutic window for Lomacoid heparin, the idea of enoxaparin, one milligram per kilogram twice a day is not thoroughly etched in stone in terms of uh, early data, and one could even, if you're scared about giving full dose, even give some uh, intermediate dose if you're too scared. Uh, obviously, heparin IV, you can titrate. Another study um, from the Spanish in um, Thrombosis Journal, 203 patients fixed dose daltaparin. They did decrease the dose for low platelets. If the platelet count was less than 50,000, they um, gave a prophylactic dose um, of 5,000 units unless it was under 10,000. And even there, they gave a smaller, if you will, prophylactic dose of daltaparin, 2,500 IU. You can see their bleed experience, 5.4% major bleeds, uh, six fatal at 8.9% recurrent bleeds, two fatal. So what do guideline groups say about anticoagulation uh, that's required in the setting of acute thrombosis? Uh, ASCO 2013, absolute contraindication, platelet count less than 20, relative if it's less than 50, uh, and pretty much similar recommendations uh, from, from some other guideline groups. Uh, perhaps the thrombosis doctors are a little bit more liberal and focus a little bit more on treating the thrombosis. They suggest transfusion uh, to platelets to count at 50,000 and give a threshold, maybe a little 25,000. They're a little bolder, perhaps. Um, here is um, a guideline document from uh, um, the ISTH uh, where uh, I point the arrows. We recommend full therapeutic doses of anticoagulation with a platelet count to maintain a count over 50,000. Um, if you can, and then you can give full therapeutic anticoagulation to a patient such as this. Um, there are, however, reductions. Uh, if the platelet count is less than 50K, of reducing doses of lock heparin to 50% of the therapeutic dose or using a prophylactic dose, as was suggested by one of those earlier studies, and only discontinuing it, really, if the platelet count is under 25,000 and can't be maintained. And this is kind of a uh, diagram um, that uh, you can peruse over with regard to these kind of algorithms of anticoagulation uh, in the thrombocytopenic patient. I would say it is not evidence-based, but based on a consensus of clotting doctors. So you decide to treat um, thrombolysis with TPA, probably not a great idea, thrive VC filter, dibigatran, platelet transfusion, low blood weight heparin, no anticoagulation, risks are too high, and I would argue that such a patient probably should get platelet transfusions and um, either, you know, IV unfractured heparin or low blood weight heparin, which has a shorter half-life, uh, so the best answer being D. So just to summarize, uh, patients with thrombocytopenia can develop thrombosis. Anticoagulation should be given with close monitoring with adjusted dose if necessary. Uh, the etiology and expected duration of thrombocytopenia will obviously greatly impact your duration. So for this patient, the first patient I presented who had an unprovoked cerebral sinus thrombosis would probably be somebody I would consider for long-term anticoagulation, but obviously, the issues of her thrombocytopenia, hopefully once she responds, will determine whether she needs six months or whether she can actually tolerate long-term therapy. So I'll stop there. Uh, thanks very much.